Grab your Bible if you have it and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I uh, preached a, a sermon about probably five weeks ago and did a part one because I couldn't get through everything I had written. I expand way too much. <laughs> and the time just flew by. <laughs> and it's starting to tick already. It's like, dude, stop the clock. <laughs> so I'm going to try to get through this again this morning. And uh, we're just going to press through it even if the clock comes down to zero. First Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to start with uh, verses 15. I'm going to read 15 and 16. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Amen? All right, so now take your Bible and rewind just a few pages back into 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, and land in chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. I really like the sound of paper Bibles. That's pretty cool. I was listening to that. 1 Corinthians chapter, you just can't get that out of your phone. It just does not make that noise. And then it crashes and you lose it all anyway. So my Bible don't crash. My Bible don't crash. That's not even the right language. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to start with verse 1 and we're going to read through verse 11. So just bear with me here. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Everybody go, ugh. Come on, everybody go, ugh. Ugh. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. Verse 8. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Verse 9. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for who? Us. Who? Us. Come on, who? Us. Us. On whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So the title of this message this morning is The Believers Watch Out Situations. This is part two. Um, and I'm going to just kind of cover a little bit of what I talked about from uh, the last sermon so we can jump into the rest of what I've got uh, written down here. So the Believer's Watch Out Situations, Part 2. Father God, we just pray over this sermon. We pray over your word. Father God, we have just been drenched by your presence this morning. And so God, I just pray that you would continue to pour out. God, that you would use my mouth. God, you would use my tongue. Father God, that I would be obedient to whatever you speak to my heart. Father God, that your word would flow. Father God, to the glory of your name and for the ministering of your word to your people. Father God, have your way as we have sang. Have your way. In your name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Have your way. So, uh, I titled this The Believer's Watch Out Situations because when I was reading this, I was thinking about uh, some, some things that, that we have to study as firefighters, and it's called uh, 18 watch out situations, or situations that shout watch out. <clears throat> and, and as firefighters, 
every year we have to to go over uh, fire behavior and, and all kinds of different things that that uh, if you're going to fight fire you want to know how to be safe and and uh, everybody gets one of these little uh, incident response pocket guides and there's a ton of stuff in here but the thing I'm keying in on this morning is is the back cover of this and it says watch out situations and there's 18 of these situations and the reason why these things are on here is because in every fire situation that that we have ever experienced over time uh, where, where men have gone out to fight fire and there have been uh, casualties uh, where men have died fighting fire, that uh, there were situations that were compromised, their safety was compromised, and that's where these come from. These situations that shout, watch out. And I'm just going to read two or three of these so you kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, number 10, attempting frontal assault on a fire going out in front of a big wildland fire. We can all relate to fire, right? A couple of years ago, three years ago, we had the, the two largest fire seasons we have ever had in the state of Washington. Yeah. The two largest fires ever. Destroyed thousands of acres. Can you imagine taking yourself and a couple of buddies and going out and standing in front of the fire and saying, I'm going to fight this thing right here as it's blowing towards me. The sound of fire is like a freight train coming towards you. It is the eeriest sound you have ever heard in your life. If you've ever been around it, it is loud. And so to stand in front of a fire and try to fight it, it's ridiculous. So watch out situation. If you're trying to do that, run for your life screaming like a girl. Okay, number 11, unburned fuel between you and the fire. Okay, that happens a lot. Firefighters are out there fighting fire, and we don't always get right next to the black. It's what they call a lot of times when we're, we're, we're working along fires, you, they say the safest place for you to be is with one foot in the black. So this is all burnt down here, and, and we're building fire line. If the fire were to blow up in another direction, I've got my feet in a place where I can get back into something that's unburnt, or that's burnt already. It's not going to be burnt. But a lot of times the fire is so big, that you cannot be that close. And so it's a watch out. Okay, if I've got a half a mile of unburned fuel between me and the line, I've got to really be careful because if that thing blows up, it's something to watch out for. <laughs> the last one, taking a nap near the fire line. <laughs> you laugh, but it's true. <laughs> you get out there and you've fought fire for 24, 36 hours and you're tired and it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And everything is kind of calming down. You're like, oh, I just got to sit down just for a second. And, and you find a stump hole and, and you kind of dig it out a little bit. Because I'm talking from experience. Okay? <laughs> you dig it out a little bit and you sit down and you're like, okay, this is comfortable. Okay, I'm just going to rest just a little bit. And all of a sudden, the division supervisor walks by and kicks your boot and says, hey, Nolan, what are you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm taking a nap near the fire line. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out situations. Um, every casualty fire has had multiple of these that have been broken. That's why all of a sudden it's a casualty because these things start to compound and they start to add up. And if you don't try to mitigate these issues, you don't try to mitigate these things, uh, there's going to be problems. And, and your life is on the line. And, and uh, as, as firefighters, as leaders uh, fighting fire, you don't want to put uh, firefighters in, uh, in risk of losing their lives. How does that relate to the believer? Okay, a believer is to follow God. And, and following God means that I've got this book instead of this little pocket guide. This little pocket guide is for firefighters. This is for life. Okay, so if, if I'm going to call myself a believer, if I'm going to follow God, if I'm going to say that He is the Lord and Savior of my life, then from Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, which says, in the beginning, to the last verse of Revelation, which says, Amen. Everything in between is God's word written by men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Every word that's penned in this book was God-breathed for what? Just because it's a good fairy tale? Okay, we, we heard a little bit about that in Sunday school. This is not 
a book of fables. This is God's breathed word for you and I. And so if we're going to call ourselves a believer, we must believe every part of this book. Every piece of what God has written down in this book, we must stand on it. And we must think about it. And we must feed on it. And we must let it just burn in our hearts and burn in our spirits. Amen? Amen. Come on. So, uh, the believers watch out situations. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Well, the passage we just read, it, it, there's two parts to it. Okay, verses 1 through uh, 6 is kind of a setup for what's going on. Verse 7 through 9 and, and 10 and 11. Those are the actual watch outs if I were to break it, break it down. But verses 1 through 6 is God setting up the scene. God setting up the scenario that you have the children of Israel who actually lived what we are experiencing in the spirit today. The children of Israel who were delivered from Egypt. God moving on their behalf. God working in their hearts, working in their lives, delivering them from bondage in Egypt. And how many of us know that, that Egypt is a type and shadow of, of the sin nature and, and sin in our lives in the world, right? Come on. And so they are actually, they've been delivered from the bondage of Egypt. They have gone through the desert. They have met God on the mountain. And, and then they approach uh, the Jordan River, they're about, they're looking across into Canaan, they're looking at the promised land. God, in the entire time, doing awesome and amazing things in their lives. The presence of God is with them in a way that, that we can't hardly even imagine. Can you imagine being led every day by a, uh, by a cloud, the presence of God, the pillar of cloud, and then at night by a pillar of fire? Can you imagine that? Can you, can you picture that in your mind, the presence of God going before you in that way? Yeah. I can't even fathom what that would be like. I, can, I know what, what fire is like. I have experienced fire. We just talked about firefighters and, and being around fires, but we're talking about the fire of God Amen. and being led by the fire of God. So, so the first five verses of this is, is the setup. And here's the setup. It says that they were all under the cloud. They were all, they, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and the rock was Christ. That's awesome. Yeah. They experienced God in a way that, in, in a tangible, seen way. Now, we experience God in a, in a different way. We experience His presence in our heart and in our life. But they saw it. They saw it in front of them. But it says, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered across the desert or over the desert. And it goes on and says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Why? You know, I look at that and I think they... they witnessed the presence of God every day. 24 hours a day, they experienced the presence of God, either cloud or, or by fire, or the presence of God feeding them food from heaven, water coming from a rock that followed them. Everywhere they went, they, were, they, they, they had water that, that flowed from this rock. The presence of God going with them in, in everything that they did. How is it, how is it then that God was not pleased with them? There's a difference in knowing about something and knowing something. That's right. Yeah. You can know something, but then, but then you can not know something. Okay, and I mentioned this last time that I ministered this, and I'll use it again. We or has old cars. He's got some really cool old, old cars. How many of us know about Lee's old cars? Okay, how many have seen them? Raise your hand. Okay, most of us in this room have seen Lee's old cars. You've worked on them. You've painted them. You, I mean, you, have, you know them. Okay, they're his cars. 
Okay, I don't know Lee's cars like Lee knows his cars. I know of Lee's cars. I see him drive them. I, I see, I've seen them in his, in his shop, at his house. He's got some really neat rides. But I don't know those like Lee knows them. Okay, we can come to church. We can, we can be in this house. We can come here Sunday morning, Sunday night, to small groups, or if we were doing regular services, which we've done for years, we can come here on Wednesday night, and we cannot know God. We can come here, and we can be in His presence. We can witness the, the presence of God moving and working in the hearts and lives of people around us, but we can, we can be in a place where we don't know God. This is where the children of Israel were at. They saw the presence of God. God delivered them from bondage in Egypt. God did amazing things in their lives. Splitting the Red Sea as they walked through it. Just the Red Sea deeper than this building. Can you imagine seeing fish, seeing the things that they saw in the water? And they walked through on dry land. Not in mud, on dry land. God doing amazing things, but they did not know Him. They didn't have intimacy with Him. As you start looking, we're going to look into all of these things, these four watch out situations. They knew of God. They saw the, the working of God. They saw God doing amazing things around them, but they didn't have an intimate relationship with God. And that is the, the, one of the saddest parts of, of this entire story, but it's written as a warning for you and I. Come on. So, let's jump right into this. Four watch-out situations for the believer. Now, two of these I've covered. Okay, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll want to get my part one. Okay, talk to Daniel. He's got all kinds of goodies. He can, he can hook you up, man. He is the hookup guy. He can get you set up. But I'll just, I'll just touch on him real briefly. Okay, so uh, four watch out situations. Number one, idolatry, which is in verse 7. And, and this whole thing comes from Exodus 32 and the golden calf. Okay, this, everything they did was in the name of religion. Everything that they did. You know, we look at the story, we think, man, that's just nuts. But they did what was natural to them. Okay, Moses goes up on the mountain. He's gone for a long time. And, and the people are like, he ain't coming back. He's gone. Dude, we, we are out here leaderless. Aaron come, or Aaron, come here. Hey, make us a God. Make us Jehovah. Okay? Give, give us Jehovah. Make, make this thing. And, and he carves out a golden calf. And, and they sit down. And, and they worship Jehovah. They offer sacrifices. They do all this stuff, which was natural to them. Why? Because they came from Egypt. That's what the Egyptians did. They did this. They, they witnessed it for hundreds of years. They were in Egypt as the Egyptians uh, worshipped the sun god, the moon god, and, and the Nile god, and your mama's god. And they, they saw all these things that, that, that the Egyptians did. You know? And so it was natural to them. And so that without God, what do you do? You go back to your sin nature. You go back to what, what is natural to you. And so that's what ended up happening here. And, the, and they began to have idol worship. But the issue is deeper than that. It's a lack of intimacy with God. It's, it's us. It's you and I as believers not keeping God in the place that He belongs in the forefront of our lives. Our eyes focused on Him. And so all of a sudden something else creeps in. And this creeps in. We're not worshiping bugs and, and animals and, and weird things. But we worship our jobs. We worship money. We worship position. We worship ca we, cars. I guess we can say weird stuff. Because cars wear out. Cars are... It's ridiculous. I was 16 one time. <laughs> wanting a nice car. Getting a pickup. Fixing it all up. Oh my gosh, this is so awesome. And then after five years and the payments were all done, it was wore out. Because I was horrible on it. I just tore it to pieces. And so I traded it off for a new one. Cars. You worship weird, stupid things. Okay? Anything that takes the place of God in your life. It's idol worship. It's idolatry. God does not want us to have other things over Him. So number one, watch out situation. If as a believer you're finding yourself 
more focused on things around you than focused on the things of God, then it's a watch out situation. Watch out. Because this is, this is not good. Number two was sexual immorality. Verse 8, uh, sexual immorality. This comes out of Numbers 25, uh, verses 1 through 9. Again, this is an intimacy issue. With a lack of intimacy with God, your heart begins to turn to other things. Your heart begins to turn to immoral things. Something that I need a connection with something. And, and we think that, that sex will give us that connection. And, and it was the downfall to the children of Israel. If you read through the story and you really study into this, you know, you have Balak, who is the king of the Moabites, and he's wanting Balaam to, to curse the people. He can't curse the people. But what he does say is this. Look, if you want to bring these people down, have your women go over to the men and have them come on over here and, and get them involved in idol worship and in pagan revelry and sexual immorality, and that will bring the people down. See, if you study into this, you understand that no wonder God says, hey, here's marriage, and it's a man and a woman, and sex should be between a husband and a wife only. Right. Yeah. Sex should not be outside of marriage. Right. Sex was not designed for that. God designed it as an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. Right. And, it was, and it was created, God created, and He said it's wonderful, it's beautiful. This is what God designed. And as men, we are called to lead our families. We are called to stand up. We are called to stand against any of that in any sort of way. Pornography, fornication, adultery. When, and if you have fallen, stand up. Know the word of God. Know the truth of God's word. Get your heart set on God. And then begin to, begin to live what you believe. And to stand up for it and to speak out. For, for, for you to just hold back and say, well, I know I've been involved in this and you don't even know where I've been all, you know, and I've got this and that. No, it doesn't matter. You give your heart to God. You allow God to wash and cleanse you. And then you walk for the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. That's part one. Okay, so let's move into uh, number three. Slap your neighbor and say, get ready to go. Slap your other neighbor and say, buckle your seatbelt. Go, go flying out of your seat. Alright. So, number three. Testing God. Testing God. This is verse, verse number nine. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Just a little... Just a little snippet of a verse here. That's all it is. What, what is going on here? Numbers chapter 21, <coughs> verses 4 through 9. Um, the people complained about their desert experience. Uh, Numbers chapter 14, the people came to uh, the Jordan River. They're looking across to the promised land. God's promise is for them. It's right there in front of them. And, 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 and they turn away. They're complaining about their desert experience. There's, there's things going on in this verse. Um, God, you're not going to do anything for me. God, you're not going to take care of me. God, you're not going to... You can put whatever you want to put on it. A complaining spirit and a rejecting spirit is what's going on here. And it's a testing of God. So two issues that are related to this testing God... First one is rejection of God's promise. The rejection of God's promise. I just mentioned that here's the children of Israel are standing looking at their promise. Spies go into the land, they check it out, they come back, and, and the and ten of the spies are like, oh, we can't do it, man. This is just crazy. There's giants over there. They're huge. And there's a lot of them. We're like grasshoppers in front of them. We can't, we can't do it, man. We just can't do it. And Caleb and, and Joshua were like, what are you, a bunch of pansies? Don't you understand who is on our side? We have God on our side. We have the Lord who has delivered us from the hands of the Egyptians. What are you talking about? They're big. Our God is bigger. And we, and we get excited about that. But the whole assembly are like, oh, we can't do it. And they start whining and 
and they start crying, and Joshua and, and, and Caleb are like tearing their clothes like, you idiots! <laughs> you wimps! Get them out of here! We can take it, Moses. Come on, I know God is on our side. You know? But the people rejected God's promise. God promised them that land. God gave that to them before they ever got there. Before they were ever delivered from Egypt, that land was theirs. And God had promised it to them. And He led them there. And they're standing looking at their promise. How many of us have stood looking at our promise and said, I can't do that. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. I can't, I can't get up there and preach. I can't get up there and sing. I don't have a voice for it. I can't do this or that. I can't witness to somebody. They're going to think I'm weird. What if I... Uh, I can't... Really? What is God's promise over your life? What has God given to you before you have ever gotten to the place where God is actually going to move you into your promise? How many of us have stood on the precipice of God's promise and looked at the greatness and the good things and said... I can't do that. That's just no way. No way. We stand there with our feet over the edge. Our toes are like dipped into God's goodness. And we're like, come on. Come on. Come on. Can't do it. Can't do it. Rejection of God's promise. The second one is rejection of God as our provider and savior. We reject God as our savior. As our provider, God's given us a promise. We're on the edge of it, and He's going to take us in there, and He's going to provide even when it doesn't look like He's going to provide. Even when we don't understand where it's going to come from, we don't understand what He's going to do. And it's like, I don't see anything. I don't know how that's going to happen. Hmm. I can't. I can't. It's safer back here. This is this is firm ground. I, I've got this is all safe for me, and I can do this, and I can. That's not where God wants. God wants you to step. Yeah. Up. He wants you to say, "Okay, here I am. Take me. Take me. I can. I will go wherever you call me to go." Yeah. Come on. Rejection of Him as their Savior. If you read into these verses, it's crazy. The people complained about their desert experience that they created themselves when they backed up and said, I can't do this. They created their misery. They backed off from what God had for them. And then they turn around and they say, we don't, we don't care for this food. We don't care for this water. This is detestable. This is detestable. They didn't even understand what was going on here. When verses 1 through 5 is talking about they all drank from the spiritual rock. And they all ate the same spiritual food. This is manna from heaven. The bread from heaven. What did Jesus say? I am the bread of life. Amen. Jesus said, I am Hallelujah. the bread of life. And here they are eating, literally eating food from heaven. Come on. Amen. What did Jesus say about the water? Here, here they're drinking this water that's following them throughout the desert. Jesus told the woman at the well, you drink from this water from this well, you'll always be thirsty. But if you drink from the water that I give you, if you drink from this water that I give you. See, they, they rejected the living water. They rejected the bread of life. And here they are in this miserable place that they're creating themselves. Do, how often do we, uh, knowing that God has a promise in our lives, but we're, we're rejecting, kind of even in the same way, rejecting God's God's uh, power to, to be able to carry us through. Jesus Christ as our provider. Jesus Christ as our Savior. Amen. Jesus Christ as our Lord and Comforter. Everything that God provides through Christ, through what He did on the cross, is for us. Amen. All we have to do is accept it and walk it out. Amen. So here they are, rejecting all of this. And it's a lack of intimacy. Once again, when you don't have intimacy with God, you don't understand what God is doing. You don't, you don't see it. You don't feel it. Yeah. And, the, and the issue is, yeah. is that you have to relinquish control and allow yourself to be as close to God as you possibly can. These yeah. songs that we sang this morning, Great Are You, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. All the earth will shout your praise. Why? Because you are great, God. 
And this last song that we sang, my whole life is yours. I give it all. Surrender to your name. Surrender everything, every part of you. Why? So God can do what God wants to do in you. Amen. You are the vessel that God wants to take to, to the world around you. Not, not Pastor Randy, not Pastor Shane, not anybody else. There is people that only you can reach. Not, not me, not Pastor Randy, not Pastor Pam, Pastor Cindy, or Pastor John. Some of us don't have the avenues that you have, but you have the ability... To speak into hearts and lives in a way that nobody else can. Yeah. You are called. That's good. You are called to minister the word of God to people around you that may be hurting. That may be in, in, in bad places, in bad situations. Praying for somebody that, that may need prayer. Or just being there in a way that only God can minister to somebody else. Amen. You are called. Amen. You are the vessel that God wants to use. Amen. It's a lack of intimacy that we have. And then we end up living by our sin nature. Maybe it's unintentional. Maybe we're not trying to, but, but that's what we go back to. Because it's, because it's the norm. Uh, the rest of the story is these, these snakes. God, God brings these snakes to kill the people. And they're getting bit and they're, and they're dying. And, and what they do is they raise a snake up on a pole. What, what in the world is that? The first time I read that, I was like, that's <laughs> Why in the world do they put snake on a pole? I mean, I've put snakes on all kinds of things. I've done weird things to snakes. But I'm just like, <laughs> drive over a black pole. <laughs> I think this is sick. Drive over a rattlesnake real slow to watch it pop. <laughs> only, only somebody from Brewster would do something like that. Come on. <laughs> Wow, that was crazy. That was crazy. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. It's... What in the world is this all about? Okay, what they did was they, they went back to sin. They went back to their sin nature. And so what did Jesus do? Jesus took sin of the world on his shoulders, exchanging himself... Giving, taking our sin on His shoulders and giving us His righteousness. Giving us His life. Giving us the ability to be free. And He needs lifted up on a pole. Why? So that we could walk in freedom. That's what this was all about. Is this, this sin is lifted up on a pole and when the people would look at it, they, they were delivered from that. And we are delivered from the, 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 the bondage of sin when we look on Christ and we allow what Jesus did at Calvary to flow into my life. And I say, this is, I don't have anything to give but my life. So here it is. Everything that I am is given to you. And all of a sudden there is freedom that flows into the life of a believer. And intimacy is created with God. Intimacy is created. Testing. We don't want to test. That's a watch out situation. You don't want to test the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Number four is grumbling. Verse 10. Grumble. How many have ever grumbled? And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. What is going on here? Numbers. Chapter 16. This is a complete rejection of God and His authority. Complete rejection of God. How does that happen? A lack of intimacy? See, when, when you don't have intimacy with God and you don't understand what's going on, your heart becomes hardened. And all of a sudden, the things of God, no, it doesn't work for me. You don't know how many people, and I know Pastor Randy can probably 10 times what, I, what I've experienced, 20 times, experience people that come to church and i gotta, I got to get fixed. My life is falling apart. My, my wife hates me. I'm kicking the dog and the dog hates me. I, I, I'm, I'm spending my money on, on slot machines and I'm out of money so the slot machine hates me. And everything hates me. I need a fix. God, you've got to fix my life. God, you've got to do something, and I, and I need it now because, you know, in two weeks, well, I got, it's going to happen right now. That's not even what it's about. God is 
isn't about fixing your life. He's not a vending machine where you can take your coins and stick into the vending machine and say, you know what, I need, I need this right here. And you push the button and it pops out this fix and you, it's, it's like, it's like you go to the vending machine, God, I need this, and you stick your money in and you, and you pull out the, jug, the, the bottle and you pop the top and, ah, yeah, I'm good to go. That's ridiculous. That's not how God is. God is more interested in your heart than interested in the things that you've got going on around your life. You created that nonsense. Now, does God want to help you? Does God want to fix issues? Yeah, but He's going to work on it through your life. He's going to get you straightened out. He's going to get you in a place where you can hear His voice. And when you start following God, and you start allowing the presence of God to lead you, and draw you into intimacy, and work in your heart and your life, then the things around you begin to get squared away. Yeah. God's not going to square the things all around you so that you can have a comfortable life. That's not what it's about. God wants to get your heart right. He wants you to have intimacy with Him. Numbers chapter 16, here's these guys. Korah, Dathan, Abiram, Own. And 250 leaders in the camp of Israel. 250 people. And they become insolent. They're like, Moses, I can't believe that you would lead us out of Egypt to bring us to this place, that you would do this to us. And then you say that the people aren't, aren't godly. Are you serious? Do you think God is not in the people? Do you think God is not working in all of these people? God is God's working in all the people. Who put you in charge? How dare you stand up in front of the people and think you have a right to lead these people? Who put you and Aaron in charge? And they're, they're actually saying God's leadership over the people is not good enough. Good. We, can, we can do it better. God, God, you're not doing anything for me. You didn't fix my marriage. You didn't fix my family. You didn't fix this or that. So I, forget it. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to lead myself. I'm going to do it my way. If this is how, I'm not going to get on my knees. I'm, I'm not going to surrender to a God who doesn't do anything. <laughs> Pooey on it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to lead my life the way I see fit. That is what these people are doing. They're standing there in front of the tent of meeting. And you can read, read into this story. Chapter 16 of Numbers. Satan did the very same thing. Standing in heaven. You know, I can lead heaven better than God can. And I bet you that all of these angels, I bet I can get every one of them on my side. And I can overthrow God out of his throne. And so what did he do? He tried. A third of the angels believed him. A third. That's crazy. They're in the presence of God. Yet a third of them are like, you know what? Dude, you're right. You are the beautifulest angel up here. There's a reason why you're good looking. Because you're smart. I don't believe what he has to say. I'm going to go with you. Because you're good looking. <laughs> and you sing oh so wonderful. Some music to my ears. Tell me more. Tell me more. And, you re and they ended up rejecting God's kingship, God's position, God's authority in their lives. And, and all of those people were destroyed. The ground opened up, swallowed the leaders up, and the 200 feet, uh, 250 leaders that were, they, the story says they brought incense before the tent of meeting, they were all burned up except for the censers that had cola. Destroyed, just like that, fire came down from heaven. All because they thought they could do it better than God. We cannot do it better than God. Amen. This is a huge watch out situation. If we start thinking in our hearts and our lives, we can do it better than God, you better watch out. Because God will say, all right, you think you can do it better than me? Here you go. Have at it. And when you're done, I'm still going to be here. My arms open wide, ready to receive you. But go ahead if you think you can do it better than me. Rejecting God. Hard heart. Grumbling against the presence and the Spirit of God. You go on in that 
in uh, verse 10, it says the destroying angel, that they were destroyed by the destroyed. Dis dis <laughs> they were destroyed by the destroying angel. That, that's a reference to Exodus where they're in Egypt and they were commanded to put blood on the doorposts because the destroying angel was going to come through. What are we to do? We are always supposed to be before the throne of God. Our hearts open to Him, broken before the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we are broken before the Lord Jesus Christ, His blood covers us. His blood washes over us and we're made new and we're made complete in the presence of God. But when you're rejecting the presence of God, you are outside of that protection. You are not in the protection of what God has already done for you through the cross of Calvary. Amen? So verse, seven, or verse 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. This is, this is for you and I. This isn't just some fun little story that, that's in the Word of God. Not just some little thing. We, we read some things like this and we're like, well, what is that? Why is that there? It's as a warning. It's a watch out situation. It's watch out situation saying, hey, are you have this going on in your heart? Are these things going on in your life? Where are you right now? And it says uh, on those at the fulfillment of the age, this is the church age. This is right now. This isn't some time before, this isn't some time later, but this is the time from, the, from, from Christ's ascension into, back into the kingdom where he sits at the right hand of the throne of God till the time he comes back. That time is the church age. That's the time that we're in right now. What is God saying to us today? What is God bringing before our minds and our hearts today? Watch out situations. He's, he's telling us to be aware. So let's go over back over to Timothy. First Timothy. First Timothy. Shin, will you come on up? First Timothy. Chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. And we'll read through this and begin to land this plane. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I'm going to go back and I'm going to, I'm going to pull out the call to action words. Be diligent. Give yourself holy. Watch your life and doctrine. Persevere. God is asking you today, not just, not just saying something, but He's calling you to action. Yeah. He's calling you to do something. He's calling you to look deep inside. Are these things going on? Do I have anything going on in my life that takes the place of you in my life? Anything that separates me from you? Anything that, that captures my mind all the time. Is, it, is there anything in my heart and life that I'm intimately drawn to that's not a deeper intimacy than marriage, but an intimacy with God? A deep intimacy that can only happen between a husband and a wife. An intimacy that God wants to have deep into the heart and soul of a person who says, God, here I am. Every part of me is yours. As I give every part of myself to my wife, God, I give every part of me to you. Is there anything that's separating me as in, in an intimate relationship with God? Am I, do I have promises that are in front of me that I'm not stepping out? Are there promises 
that I'm not accepting and saying, God, I know you have this for me. I don't want to test you. I want to be obedient to the call on my life. I'm going to walk this out. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it takes, God, here I am. Or is there any part of me that says, I can do this better? I can do better than what you're asking of me, God. But God, if you would just, if you would just do it this way, I think that it would be better. God, maybe if you would, if if, if I spoke this way, it would be. But God is, I'm not going to reject you all out and say, no, I can do this better than you. Be diligent. Give yourself holy. It means constantly pressing into the presence of God. Having intimacy with God is not just something I do on a, on a Sunday or a Wednesday. It's constantly pressing in. Be diligent. It means that's got to be on the forefront of my mind. I have to work on this all the time. I have to press in. I have to get close to God. I've got to, to know the mind and the heart of God. I have to say... Standing here in front of you, I don't get it right. I don't. So I can relate to where you're sitting out here because most of the time I'm sitting out here listening to the Word of God preached. Or I'm sitting in the presence of God going, God, but you don't. Seth, Shane, you don't get it right all the time, but I love you. And I have a plan for you. And I know your heart and your heart is to serve me and to love me and to be obedient to me, you can do this. Come on, you can do this. Yeah. Stand on your feet. Stand to your feet. Because if, Shane, if, if you're going to do anything for me, you can't be sitting on your backside. You've got to be standing to your feet. Yeah. Be diligent. Pressing in to God. Giving yourself holy. Watch your life and doctrine and persevere. Life throws curveballs all the time, but you can't just go, man, that came out of left field. I'm just giving up. I can't do this. It's too hard. I can't. No, you persevere. You press in. This is, Jesus isn't just something you do here or you do there. or He's not a part of you like, like my nice clothes in my car. I got Jesus. Jesus is life. Jesus is everything. He is every. He is the main part of why you get up in the morning. The, the first breath you take when you wake up in the morning is the breath of God. It's your breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise. I pour out my praise to you. It's your breath, God. When I wake up in the morning, it's God doing something in me. He's birthing new things in me. He's stirring in me to do kingdom things. It doesn't matter where I'm at. It doesn't matter what's going on in my day. God can use me to touch somebody. God is birthing those. And then at the end of my day, the last thing I think about is Jesus. Jesus. God, I thank you for my day. God, I thank you. It's been the hardest day ever. This has been horrible, but God, you're still on the throne and I'm not going to stop serving you. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter how horrible this has been. I'm thinking this. I have never known a stronger man who watched a stronger man in my life than Dennis Loudon. Gosh, we all know pain. But he experienced pain. That's right. We serve the same God that leads us and breathes life into us every day. There are men that know you, that I know, and they're always asking, how's Dennis doing? He loves the Lord. Without God, I don't know. You're speaking to people. You are speaking to people, even though you don't even, don't even know. How many people are we speaking to? Persevere. 
watch your life from doctrine. God is calling us to action. God is calling us to action. Church, bow your heads with me this morning. Lord Jesus. Oh. You are so good. Father God, we just pour our hearts out before you this morning. We give ourselves wholly to you. God is speaking these things. He's been speaking these things all morning. If any of these things has rang true with you, I just want you to give it from your seat and just step forward and just allow the presence of God to wash over you because God wants to do something amazing in your heart and in your life. And you may, you may come up to the front, you may not feel anything in the moment, but God is doing something. The mere fact that you're in obedience and saying, all right, yep, here I am. Here I am, God, use me. Here I am, send me. God, I don't know how this is going to look. I don't know how it's going to work out, but here I am. And I'm, and I'm surrendering my heart and my life to you. God is still speaking. If there's anybody else, any of these things have run true. Lord, I don't want to keep myself separated from you. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. One thing about it, God speaks truth. He never holds anything back. What a friend. What a friend. Father God, we just, we just cry out to you this morning. God, over every heart, every life, every person that has come to the front of this church, Father God, we pour our hearts out to you this morning. Father God, we cry out to you that your presence, that your spirit would flow into us, God. That you would transform us, Father God, from what we were when we came into this house. Father God, to something totally different, Father God, as we leave this place. God, you are doing something in the hearts and lives of every believer in this house. As Pastor Randy said, 2017, there are new things that are being birthed in every believer. There are new things that are being birthed in us. And so, God, where are you taking us? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't understand. But, Father God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to step out on the water. Even though it's weird, it seems crazy. I don't know what it's going to look like. I'm going to keep my eyes focused on you. God, empty me of everything I am and Father God, give me intimacy with you. Intimacy with you. Intimacy with you. Intimacy. Just cry out to Him this morning. God, we cry out to you. God is breaking chains. He's loosing spirits. He's setting the captive free. This is why he came. Not to pat us on the head and say, good job, Johnny. But to give us life. To wash us. To cleanse us. To make us new. God, we thank you. Father God, I don't understand what you're doing. Father God, it might even hurt. It might, it might be painful in the moment. But God, you are doing something amazing. God, you are doing something amazing. Leaders, if you're up here up front, just, just go through and, and pray for individuals. Pray for each other. Just begin to pray and to call out to God. Lord, I pray over every person. Father God, I just thank you for your word. Father God, I thank you for your passion for your people. Lord God, I just pray that your presence and your spirit, Father God, would go with us. Father God, as we leave this place, Lord God, wash, cleanse, transform us. Father God, may your presence and your spirit go before us. Lord God, we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. Small groups tonight.